The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care. Church, I just want to say welcome to Blank Slate Ministries. If you are joining us for the very first time today, I just want to say thank you for being with us today on this beautiful Sunday morning. I am just so excited to be with you today. And I want to, I want to give you just a couple quick announcements. We say it every single week, but I'm going to continue to reiterate it. And as we are growing, we are, we are growing exponentially. I mean, we went from you know, like a hundred followers to we were almost 900 the last time I checked. I mean, we're, we're growing exponentially and the, the teachings that we have are getting more and more views. So I'm going to encourage you to continue to follow our daily teachings Monday through Saturday at 9 a.m. Now they're only 30 minutes, very short, very sweet, but jam packed full of, full of powerful revelation. And you don't want to miss those. And what we teach during the week, culminates to what we teach on the weekend and it leads us into the next week so all of the teachings go together the lord spoke to me a long time ago that if you teach for an hour on sunday that's only an hour but if you teach for 30 minutes during the week every day and an hour on sunday that's four hours a week of teaching so i encourage you to just always continue to follow along with us as we study this deep truth dealing with end time prophecy I also want to continue to encourage you to take our discipleship curriculums Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. You can find more information at blankslateministries.org slash discipleship. Now, the main question that always comes in is, how do I enroll in the class? If you buy a curriculum, which means you go to blankslateministries.org slash store and you buy a curriculum, it will auto-enroll you in the class. You'll get a link in your email. It'll say, hey, go here fill out the information like it'll give you a password you know login password and then you can access the participant tab the participant tab is where you get the answers the additional resources free downloads and we will mail you your curriculum or if you're local you can pick up your curriculum now depending on what the lord does next in this ministry whether we are going to be stateside or whether we are going overseas will determine whether the curriculums themselves will go fully electronic. So we might be doing electronic curriculums moving forward. I will release more information on that as we proceed, but the information inside of the books will not change no matter what. And we will continue to teach the word of God and upload teachings no matter where we are at. So I encourage you to continue just to follow along with us. Now, I want to encourage you one last time is just to share. Now, we have social media at blankslate.chicago on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, 
you know, obviously our YouTube channel. And I want to encourage you to continue to share because what God is doing in your life, God wants to do in somebody else's life. But they're going to only receive if you share with them. So I encourage you that as I minister to you, you share and minister it with others. And when I say share, I don't necessarily mean share blank slate ministries. Now, I want you to share blank slate. I want you to bring them in. Let me teach them. Let me grow them up as much as I'm growing you. But I, what I really mean when I say share is I want you to share the Word of God. Because as God is teaching you, I want you to teach others. I just want you to share because it's all about all of us coming into maturity and growing up in the Lord. It's not about advancing a ministry or becoming popular or getting a big following. It's not about any of that. We preach this message when there was nobody watching. So I encourage you that whether we have nobody watching or a million people watching, we're going to continue to do the same work. I just encourage you to share it with others so that they can receive what you are receiving also. But I want to get I want I want to get into this lesson today because we got a powerful lesson and we got a lot of material to go over today. But before we do it, we need to receive the offering. Uh, we do not take an offering during our daily teachings, nor do we take an offering during our discipleship classes. There's you can always give at blankslateministries.org/give. You can always give online. You can give through our Facebook. You can actually give through our Instagram also. But I encourage you to give on our website. And you can give at any point, but there's only one day a week where we actually do a formal offering, where we take the offering. Um, I believe the rest of the week, I just want you to receive. But Sunday, I would like you to participate in giving and receiving. Now, I want to read a verse real quick when it comes to giving. This is a verse I, I don't know if I've used in a long time for it, but I want to read a few verses. Go with me to Luke chapter 12, and I, I want you to see something real fast. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they neither have storehouse nor barn. And God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you taking a thought can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do those things which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God, if then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not what you shall eat, neither what you shall drink, neither be ye doubtful of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell all that you have, sell that you have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now we could continue to read, but we're just going to have to stop there. I, I, I want to say something real fast about this. A lot of people say that if you have a need, you sow a seed, and it's wrong. I mean, 2 Corinthians 9 even says that you're not supposed to give out of need. But the Bible is also clear in here in Luke chapter 12. It says that you don't give... Like, if the ravens don't sow or reap, yet God feeds them, why do you think that your sowing is how God feeds you? So think about that for a minute. Let me say it better. If the lilies are clothed, yet they don't toil, why do you think that you toiling is the way in which you are clothed? This is where it talks about you don't, you, you are seeking after things that the world is looking at. A lot of people, when they say, I'm going to sow for my need, or I'm going to do this to get this, what they're saying is, I am the source. Now, sowing and reaping is biblical. It is biblical law. Giving and reaping is, a, is an amazing thing to do. But I don't give 
I don't participate in the law of sowing and reaping because I'm trying to force God's hand into moving in my life. And so many people say, well, if I do this, then I can make God move. Well, no. That's, that, that's the point. Jesus is saying, you don't know who you are. That's what little faith means. Me, you don't know that you're connected to God. You think that you come into the house of God and you force God to do something. Listen, God knows that you have need of it. It's his pleasure to give it to you. And he's already done it. That's the point you don't know. I don't give on Sundays because I want to force God to move in my life. No, I give because I know God has already moved. God, you bless me and you take care of me. You are my source. You feed me. You clothe me. You open doors. You magnify yourself in my life. And because of that, I give into the ministries that teach me the Word of God. Because the more I know about it, the more revelation I have of the fact that God takes care of me. And church, I want to tell you that today. God takes care of you. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the provider. He loves you. And he, yes, he wants you to participate in giving and receiving. But he doesn't want you to give because you think that your giving affects whether he takes care of you. He is a good father and he takes care of you. Listen, you didn't have to do anything to get born again. And that's the greatest gift God ever gave you. You don't have to do anything to get God to move in your life because God did it without your say-so. He is sovereign. He moves independent of you, but he wants you to participate in the process. But my participation does not force God. God says, I knew that you had a need and I already supplied it. What I want you to do is trust me And when you give, you give because of the fact you trust me, not because you're in fear and not because you're trying to force me to move. So I pray that blessed you. I'm not going to go into any more of it today. We're going to stop right there. But church, I I pray that you just allow the Lord to speak to you in that area. So what we're going to do is we're going to receive the offering. I'm going to pray. We're going to receive the offering. And then we're going to jump right into the lesson. So Father, bless everybody that is giving today. Father, let them give out of the heart position of knowing that you are the source. You knew what we had need of before you asked. You provided before we ever said anything. And we give today out of an overflow of an abundance of love and trust and thankfulness and gratitude for the fact you are our source. And because you are, we give back unto you today. Father, let the windows of heaven be open. Pour it out over them a hundredfold in Jesus' name. I give you all the glory for it. Amen. And amen. Church, I love you. You can receive the offering right now, and we will be back in one minute, and we'll get right into the lesson. I just want to say thank you we're back thank you for giving today thank you for everybody that is giving and I just want to I want to jump right into this lesson like I said if you've been following our daily teachings I, I mentioned over the past couple days that we were going to talk about this well we're here and we're going to talk about it now and so we're going to jump right into this lesson where we're going to be talking about the harlot Babylon we're going to be talking about the harlot Babylon and as we talk about the harlot Babylon today, we're, we have this as a part of our end times curriculum part one. If you've taken our end times curriculum, you know that what we're going to talk about today is far less in detail than the curriculum. Now, that's only for time's sake. We could take an hour and a half, two hours to explain the harlot, but we're going to do it in about 30 minutes today. 
So I encourage you that if you say, hey, I want to know even more about this topic, then I encourage you to take our End Times Curriculum Part 1 where we talk about the Harlot Babylon. Those teachings are on our website as they are. You can go and watch them right now. But what we're going to be focusing on is in our End Times Curriculum, we talk about a whole lot of additional verses. We've got verses here, verses there, and we... We talk about a whole lot more, but today I'm only going to focus on Revelation 17 and 18. And what we're going to do is I'm actually going to read through all of Revelation 17 and 18. You know, I've watched people teach for a long time and there's nothing wrong with it, but they overview it. They say, you can read it on your own and that, there's nothing wrong with that. But from where I grew up in the body of Christ and how the Lord has always used me to teach, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. I like to read the Bible. I want you to hear what the Bible says. And in saying that, I'm going to make a point. If you cannot see it with your own eyes in your own Bible, then don't receive it. I don't care if you hear it from this pulpit. I don't care if you hear it from another one. I don't care where you're at in life. Only believe what you see in the Bible. Don't just believe people's opinions. Don't believe people's thoughts. Believe what the Word of God says. So, I just wanted to mention that. And that's not just for end time prophecy and for the harlot Bible. I mean, that's for any subject in the Bible. If you can't see it with your own eyes and your own Bible, then don't receive it. A great example of that is when people say, Oh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost was only for Pentecost. Well, if you look with your eyes in your Bible... You'll see the baptism of the Holy Ghost is like six or seven times in the book of Acts. It's not just Pentecost. And people are like, really? I'm like, your own eyes and your own Bible. You got to read your Bible. Now that right there demands personal responsibility, meaning you have to study, you have to put effort into it, you have to do some work. You got to study the Bible. You can't just believe what somebody says. That's why instead of me just telling you what it says, Let's read it, and you can hear what it says. And if you don't like me reading the Bible to you this much, then uh, get over it. Because <laughs> I'm going to do it. This is what I do. But let's pray, and then let's jump into the lesson. I'm going to read all of Revelation 17 and 18, and then we're going to overview the passage. So, Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your Son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Revelation chapter 17. Let's start here. We're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read all of 17 and all of 18 one time, one full swoop. So here we go. And there came out of one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, unto me come hither and i will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and i saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her, name, upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. 
The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, that and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest were ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. They have, these have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the, woman, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunken of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and they receive not her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according unto her works. And the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived delicately, so much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death, and mourning, and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who, judged, who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication, and lived delicately with her, shall bewail her, and lament for her, when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that might city, mighty city, for in one hour thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all nine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of precious wood and brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men and the fruits of that Thy soul lusteth after are departed from thee, and all these things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. And merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stone and pearls for in one hour so great riches is come to naught and every shipmaster and all the companies and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning saying what city is like unto this great city and they cast dust on their heads and cried weeping and wailing saying alas alas that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness for in one hour is she made desolate rejoice over her thou heaven and ye holy apostles and prophets for god hath avenged you on her 
And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpers shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now, we're going to talk today about what is the harlot Babylon. And the harlot Babylon has a lot of different facets. It's not just saying the harlot Babylon is this. Because that, that won't give you a whole lot of understanding. I, I want to talk about contextually what the harlot is. But I want you to read the Bible and study the Bible to understand what the Bible says. Everybody wants to be a prophet. Everybody wants to be somebody. And what you see online, on social media and teachings, and even in the church, people talk about, well, this is what's happening. Yet, when you read the Bible, the phrases that they use and the things that they say aren't biblical. Now, they might have concepts that are biblical, but the phrases and the word choices they use are not biblical. And that's why we have to study what the Bible says. So, before we actually get into explaining what the harlot is, let's talk about contextually where we're at in the storyline. So, last week we talked about the abomination of desolation. And I said the abomination of desolation is the number one biblical sign of the time. It's the number one because the minute the abomination of desolation takes place, he, when the Antichrist goes in the temple, puts his image in the temple, sits in the temple and calls himself God, and demands to be worshipped at the threat of death, and the mark of the beast, the image of the beast, and all of that takes place, that is what's called. He removes the daily sacrifice, he breaks the covenant of peace, and commits the abomination of desolation, rips his mask off and shows himself to be a beast. We talked about this all last week. The Bible says the angel stood in the water and raised his right hand and swore by God it would not go longer than three and a half years. So if you want to know, the start of the Great Tribulation is the abomination of desolation. So until you see that, you are not in the Great Tribulation. That's what the Bible says. Three and a half years after that, Jesus is coming back. So if you're saying, when is Jesus coming back? Well, if you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, stand in the holy place, then you know that the end is near. But until that happens, you're not there yet. And that's why we talk about that being the number one. But before the abomination of desolation takes place, there is something called the harlot Babylon. The harlot Babylon is the forerunner it is what comes before the abomination. Jesus, the abomination, before that is the harlot. That's the harlot Babylon. So let's talk about what this is. Well, before we actually talk about it, let's talk about the context of the story. John, the beloved who wrote all of Revelation, got 16 chapters. Obviously, we know there was no chapters and verses when they wrote it, but he got 16 chapters of Revelation. Saw the throne room of God, saw Jesus in his glorified body, saw the seals, trumpets, and vile judgments. So all of the judgment of God against the world, he's already seen. Then he saw the harlot. Revelation 17 and Revelation 18 is a parenthetical. It's where the angel explains to John why the severity of God's judgments just took place. Now, without going into this in detail, because we'll get to this later, probably next weekend, is the fact that the church will not be on the earth when the vile judgments take place. But the church will be on the earth 
when the harlot is in play and when you see the abomination of desolation. Jesus said, when you see it, well, you can't see it unless you're here. So the church will be here when the abomination of desolation takes place, which means the church will also be here when the harlot Babylon is in place. But the point of saying that this is after the judgments, and after the angel explains the harlot, the church cries out, Hallelujah, Lord God omnipotent reigneth. That shows the severity of what this is. But the reason why I say that is, if you remember, it said that John wondered with great admiration when he saw the harlot. The level of seduction and the level of deception that the harlot Babylon will possess will be greater than anything you have ever seen on the earth before. And I said over the past couple of days where we talked about self-exaltation and we talked about hold that fast, we talked about the Tower of Babel which is where the people in Genesis 11 said, we will make our own way to heaven outside of the will of God. We'll do it ourselves. And there's a lot of people that say, I will remain faithful no matter whether I study the Bible or not. And God says, that right there is the root deception of the Tower of Babel. Meaning that you think you can get to heaven. You say, I'm born again. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I move in the power of God. Yet I don't have to do it God's way. That is the pure deception of the harlot. That's the pure deception of the Tower of Babel. That in and of my own self, I'll make my own... People are like, well, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Yet when you talk, you say, I will remain faithful. Not, I study the Word of God which keeps me faithful. It's, I will do it in and of my own strength. Anything you do outside of doing it God's way is pride. But this specifically is the Tower of Babel. And the reason why I say this is when John sees this woman, it's, her name is, it says, Mystery, Babylon the Great. Now, this is rooted not just in ancient Babylon, which is, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar. In 586 BC, Babylon took the southern kingdom of Judah into captivity. So, like, it's not just ancient Babylon, but it's also the Tower of Babel. So, the harlot Babylon is rooted in the Tower of Babel. What took place, the demonic things that took place at the Tower of Babel. That's why, if you want to go back and study Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel is not about the height of the tower. It's also, it's, it's not about, you know, if it's 10 stories and if it goes 20, God's going to say, I mean, 6,000 years ago, roughly, you know, probably 5,800, 5,900 years ago, or whatever the number is, it doesn't matter. Do you think that they, with brick and slime, built a tower bigger than the John Hancock? John Hancock's that direction from where I'm sitting. It's 96 stories, you can have a drink at the, at, the, at, the, at the bar on the 96th floor. You can eat food on the 95th floor. Do you think that people at the Tower of Babel could build a building bigger than that one? Well, no. I, I wouldn't think so. I mean, the ancient buildings that we know of today is like the Roman Colosseum, the, uh, the pyramids in ancient Egypt, and none of those are the size or the height of the John Hancock. So it's not about the, 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 the height of the building. It's about the position of the heart that said, I will find my own way to heaven outside of God. And that is the root of the harlot Babylon. That's the pure root deception, is finding your own way outside of God. The harlot Babylon is in really two different spheres. The, the, the harlot Babylon is a city, and the harlot Babylon is a religion. It's a religion of tolerance. And so let's, let's talk about this for just a second. Well, let me make a point. I know I'm kind of overviewing this kind of fast. We're not going to have time to go through every verse in detail. That's why I say you got to take our curriculum. But I, I want to overview this real fast. People say the one world religion. Okay, this whole one world religion that they're talking about, the concept, now they miss it in every sphere when they talk about it. 
But the one world religion, quote unquote, if you want to know what the Bible says, the Bible says it's the harlot Babylon. That's what it's talking about. Now, people say, well, Cody, why don't you just call it a one world religion? Everybody gets that. Well, if you say it's just one world religion, then that premise, you know, that, that means cohesion and peace and justice. And that's the deception. What you need to call it is you need to call it a harlot, a great whore. The reason why this is so important to me is Revelation 17 and 18 is directly connected to Revelation 3, the church of Thyatira, but it's also connected to Hosea. Because when Hosea prophesied against the nation of Israel, he said, it's because of your harlotry, your whoredom, your adulteries. Not just physical, but it's the spiritual way in which you commit harlotry against God. That's the harlot Babylon. That's what it's referring to. Is It's, it's not just physical sex outside of marriage, which that's part of it. What it's, what it's referring to is the fact that the harlot will be a religion of tolerance. One that will corrupt morals saying that there's all ways lead to God. Not just that there's only one way of salvation to the Father through the Son. The harlot will make the deception of it'll be a false justice, false peace. It will look on the outside like it's promoting cohesion in all spheres. But it's a harlot. It's a perversion. That's why we call it the harlot Babylon. I'm never going to call it a one world. We're going to call it a harlot because that's what it is. It's whoredom in the spirit. It's adultery against God. So I'm going to come back to that, but I want to focus on the other one. The other aspect is this is a city. This is a great city, and I believe it's going to be in the same geographical location of ancient Babylon, which is in the Middle East. Well, you might say, well, I don't believe Babylon could come back. Well, I mean, Jerusalem came back. Israel came back. What makes you think Babylon can God's whole end time plan is like two cities, Jerusalem and Babylon. You know, the people of God and the people of the devil. That's like the kind of battle scene of the, of the spirit realm that you can think about. It's the way we seek after God, God's holy city, the city of the great king, Jerusalem, and Babel, the Tower of Babel and Babylon. It's just full of abominations. But so it's a city. So I want you to imagine the sphere of Dubai. Dubai was almost nothing, and Dubai is now one of the it's great money, wealth, you know, there's no crime. I mean, that, that type of stuff that you see in Dubai. Imagine that on a scale that you've never seen before. That's what the harlot, that's what Babylon is going to look like. They made a, a, a movie recently about Babylon, and, and I, I didn't even watch it. Somebody, somebody asked me, they said, you want to go watch it? I said, absolutely not. Because if you knew what Babylon was really about, you wouldn't watch it. Because it's rooted in... I'm going to get to what's behind the scenes. But on the outside, it looks good. Peace, money, prosperity. When we read through this chapter in 17 and 18, you say, decked with gold and silver. It's got purple. And when it talks about having purple and gold, it's referring to the fact that there will be political influence along with immense financial gain. I mean, the way Dubai has money, I mean, this is going to be something where all of the nations of the earth are participating with the harlot. And the merchants of the earth are made rich because of the harlot. So what, when, the, when you see this city arise, when you see Babylon come back, just understand people are going to participate and there's going to be lots of money and wealth and financial gain to participate with the harlot. But then it says, alas, alas, that great city Babylon is fallen in one hour. Let me explain to you. If you see this great city and this, this wealth and this prosperity, it's only, people are going to say, how could that ever be destroyed? And God said, I will destroy it in one hour. In one hour, I will bring that mighty city to completely nothing. And it will never be ever again. And you might say, dang, why is... Why is this judgment so severe? Well, there's this one important part about the harlot. She's got a cup. 
And the cup she's got, it says that the nations and the rulers of the king, the kings of the earth will participate in this cup. And this cup says it's got abominations and filthiness of her fornications. Well, it says that she is drunk with the blood of the saints. And if you read later on, it says that in her, in Babylon, was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and everybody that was slain upon the earth. Meaning that you have a thing that is coming, a city and a religion. Both of them are the same thing, they go together. You'll have a physical geographical location of Babylon, but you'll also have the harlot Babylon religion, this one world religion of tolerance, where every path leads to God and there's there's no absolute and there's no morals and there's none of these things. That's what the harlot Babylon is gonna promote. We're gonna talk more about it in just a second, but I want you to understand this. Behind the scenes, on the surface, peace, prosperity, justice, cohesion, all of that. Behind the scenes though, they are selling the souls of men and they're selling slaves. And they are killing the prophets and they're killing the saints. I want you to understand something. Blood does not go unanswered. When blood is shed, innocent blood is shed, meaning that you kill people just because they stand for God, God will answer it. And because what's happening behind the scenes in Babylon is that they are killing Christians. That's what we're talking about. This whole peace and justice if you stand against it, call it for what it is, and you stand for the truth of the Word of God, they'll kill you over it. And God says, it's okay, don't participate in it. Be faithful unto death, because in one hour I will destroy Babylon forever, and it'll never be ever again. But I want to say something else about Babylon. We're, we're going to run out of time in just a second. So I pray this lesson is blessing you. I know we're just generally overviewing it. You can spend a lot of time studying this but we do spend a lot of time studying this but i just want to say one last thing as we get ready to finish it says that the woman which is the babylon religion rides on the beast now the beast in the book of the revelation is the antichrist so the woman rides on the antichrist but what's interesting about that is the fact that later on the ten kings will burn the harlot they'll they'll burn the woman and you say well Cody why is that important the Antichrist will advance the harlot Babylon religion this one world religion of tolerance now you might say well why is that important if you are a lukewarm Christian if you're a lukewarm Muslim or Hindu or Buddha or whatever or you're devout either one Really, if you are any religion on the face of the earth right now, for you to go from your religion to outright antichrist worship, worship of the devil, that jump is way too extreme. I mean, people that saw Adolf Hitler was like, I might not love Jesus, but I'm definitely not gonna participate with you. Like the jump was so extreme, couldn't do it, couldn't participate in it. And even if you're just a lukewarm believer, if they, if they said, take the mark of the beast and worship the devil or we'll kill you, you, I mean, that extreme is way too far of a jump. And the devil knows that. But if it goes from, I'm just lukewarm, you know, I'm living in sin, some compromise, and, and they say, well, there's this new religion of tolerance. Every path leads to, it's okay. That sin's okay. It's no big deal. It's all about peace and justice. Well, the transition from lukewarm to participating in a religion of tolerance, that's an easy step. And the thing is, as you get corrupted in your morals, then it will eventually, you'll be so far removed from where you started that when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he says, worship me or die. It's like, well, I already have compromised so much. Then the step from the harlot to the Antichrist is an easy step. That's why it talks about the harlot riding on the beast. The Antichrist will advance the harlot Babylon before he comes on the stage because he wants you to just slowly corrupt your morals and your conscience and defile yourself to the point that when he steps on the scene, it'll be an easy step for you just to go along with it. 
I'm already so far removed from Christianity. Why would I not just follow him? You know, I'm not going to be able to eat if I don't. So I might as well just do it. That is the pure deception of the harlot. Because if it leads you, it just, it's slowly but surely going to dwindle away everything that you believe on the inside to eventually lead you to denouncing altogether. We're going to finish here in just a second, but I, I really encourage you. We have so much more material on the harlot that you can study. And this is one of my favorite lessons to ever teach. And it's one of the most important ones in the Bible. Because so many people say, I don't have to study what the end time says. I'll remain faithful no matter what. John the Apostle saw all of the throne room, saw all of the judgments of God, yet he still wondered with admiration. That's how deceptive this is going to be. If you don't study it, you will be deceived. You, if you do not have understanding, the, the percentage, I, I don't want to give a number, but and I'm not going to try to prophesy this over you, but let me tell you, you will be so far more likely to be deceived into following the harlot if you don't study it that i mean this is important it's so important we're going to continue to talk about it and unpack it because i want you to be people of understanding i want you to remain faithful i pray that when we get to heaven we all and when we get to the new jerusalem we just sit down and have a meal together and we say glory hallelujah we made it Lord God omnipotent reigneth, the one who judged the great whore and destroyed the Antichrist and threw all of evil and ungodliness in the lake of fire and put it away from us for all of eternity. I hope that is the case. But for that to be the case, we need to be people of understanding. We, don't, we need to stop relegating the truth in the Bible and putting it away. We need to be people of understanding. We need to study. We need to learn. And we need to make that decision now before it happens. It will never be easier than it is right now to make the decisions to learn. If you're not saved and you sat here and listened to me for uh, you know over 30 minutes, then I encourage you to get born again. You got to take the first step. And the first step is getting saved. The Bible says, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And you believe unto righteousness. That's not a religious phrase. That phrase means anchor your hope in the resurrection. If God raised Jesus, God will raise me. And it also says, confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord. And that confession is unto salvation. That does not mean pray a prayer. That means surrender your life. Really make that decision that I'm going to surrender my will. And I'm going to let Jesus be the one that guides me moving forward. So if you need to do that today, just pray with me and say, Father, please forgive me of all of my sin. I repent today. I change the way I think. And I pray that you give me the power to change the way in which I act. Jesus, be Lord of my life. I believe you're raised from the dead. I anchor my hope in eternity and not in my temporal circumstances. Right now, I, command, I, I pray that you are Lord. Be Lord of my life. I surrender my will. From now moving forward, you will be the one in which I follow. And you are the dictation of my life here until the end. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you're now born again. It's that simple. I want you to reach out to us. I want to get you some next steps. But let me pray for you, church, as we go to finish. Remember, follow our daily teachings. Get enrolled in our classes. But, Father, bless these people in Jesus' name. I give you all the glory. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day, and we will see you tomorrow. The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow. Oh, the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Because you take good care of me. You take good The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past.
Take good. 